Okay, then let's get started. You can hear me, I guess. I can hear myself through the loudspeakers. So. so that's just the abstract that we had on the agenda. I will skip that and instead go to the actual content here. Um, I will, I mean, most here have seen some OpenACC before, but I will give a short introduction where this is all coming from and what it's useful for. Then introduce the OpenACC kernels construct uh, in contrast to some other parallelization construct that the OpenACC has. Show the original approach that we took to implement this, um, which didn't work out, unfortunately, or only in a very limited way. Um, then we will take a step back to actually re-examine what real-world code looks like and how we can uh, benefit from that to um, do a new implementation of the OpenACC kernels construct. And then I will show the phase one in more detail, um, the transformation steps that we have implemented, which we are in the process of getting integrated in GCC trunk. Of course, when there is a phase one, there will also be a phase two or maybe more, but that was just too much for this one talk here. So that's um, a block diagram of a GPU, for example, here, NVIDIA Kepler K20, which is from 2013, I think. Yeah, right, when, when we started this project initially, this open ACC support in GCC. Um, I just wanted to show here there are a lot of, of small green boxes and other boxes. Essentially, each of the green box is one algorithmic unit, one mini CPU, if you want it that way. And the objective then is to uh, get all these cores busy. So in a traditional CPU system, you have one of them, or multi-core systems, a few of them, but not in the hundreds or thousands that we have here. So standard example, matrix multiplication. Uh, I guess I don't have to introduce the code here. Um, we have these three levels of loops nested in each other, and uh -huh, here we have some pointer. Um, this operation in here that uh, uh, calculates the number of, of each of the target um, uh, matrix elements. So using the OpenACC parallel construct, um, the, you would change the code as follows, for example. Um, you put the, so OpenACC is, is, is an um, extension to C, C++, and Fortran, and it works that you put a um, prag mass in, in the case of C and C++, or in Fortran, it's source code comments, uh, in front of or around the regions that, that these prag mass then apl um, apply to. So for example, this ACC parallel opens a new block here in this C program. Um, which means that this, this whole block should be spawned in parallel and offloaded to a GPU, for example. Um, you have, in the, with GPUs typically have um, separate memory spaces from the CPU or host memory space, so you have some data directives here. Copy in means to copy data from the host to the device, as we also call generally the offloading thing. Um, here you copy two-dimensional arrays, of course, copy out, does the obvious. Then there are more things, but that's just a simple example here. In there we have this pragma ACC loop, gang, worker vector. That's the three levels of parallelism that OpenACC offers. Again, that's here, for example, written in, in terms of what the NVIDIA GPUs offer. For AMD GPUs, it's similar, uh, different names, essentially. And um, also you could use that for multi-core parallelism. Gangs would map to CPU multi-cores. Workers don't exist for CPUs, and vectors would be the vector instructions that you have on a CPU, for example. So that's just to illustrate how you could map these three levels of parallelism to the three nested loop constructs that we have in here, these four loop constructs. <clears throat> what we also need is a reduction operation on this T scalar um, because otherwise you can't parallelize that. Um, you have a data dependence between the, all the 
vector loop iterations that would all try to uh, add into this t variable. So you need to have a private copy of that for each of the vectors and then at the end do so your reduction operation to sum up all these private copies. So that's the OpenACC example, OpenACC parallel construct, a prescriptive construct that actually tells the compiler here, take this code and parallelize it as I describe with these pragmas. Similar, you can use um, with OpenMP target offloading. So either you have a target distribute, would be I think the gang level and then all the OpenACC, uh, OpenMP pragmas corresponding in a way. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, so that's the code you have to write here, and as you can see in this matrix multiplication, it's a, a, a lot, quite a lot um, pragmas that you have to add. So the standards committee for OpenACC wanted to make things simpler for the user and introduce this kernels construct, which again defines a region of the program that is to be compiled for execution on an accelerator device into a sequence of kernels. I will go into more into detail that later. <coughs> right, that's the same again. Each loop nest will be a distinct kernel. La 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 la. Yeah. Okay. And what that tells us is that the user doesn't have to mark up loops with this open ACC loop directive that we've seen. So you can greatly simplify the usage of open ACC here. You just say pragma ACC kernels instead of parallel, and then you don't have to specify is ACC loop directives. Instead, um, the compiler has to figure out that stuff. For that, there is no corresponding um, pragmas in or constructs in OpenMP. That may, however, change in the future. They are slowly also moving in the direction of adding such more descriptive um, constructs in comparison to the prescriptive ones that they have. Right. So th that's what we then here have, have here for this matrix multiplication. And now the question is, of course, how to teach GCC to deal with that. GCC has to figure out if all these loops can be parallelized and if they should be parallelized. And uh, for, for example, you could have more deeply nested loops, that's actually a very common thing if you look into scientific codes, for example. You have for i, for j, for k, for l, for m, for n, all tightly nested into each other. Right, and if loops may be parallelized, can be parallelized, that's primarily a question whether there are data dependencies between the um, individual items in the loop. Um, if there are data dependencies, there is sometimes a way to work around them, for example, by adding such a reduction operation or by otherwise restructuring the code, which, of course, is more complicated, requires a lot more compiler logic. That's, for example, what the graphite framework is doing in GCC. Okay, so the original approach um, was to use the existing par loops passed in GCC, which was originally implemented um, for this F3 parallelized loops flag, which um, synthesizes uh, OpenMP parallel 4 construct, so just to make use of the multi core capabilities and it's guarded on the number of iterations that a loop does, so it only um, is executed that way if, if it's more than a thousand or something like that because when you spawn additional threads, of course, you have overhead. And you only want to do that if it's really useful to the code. So we thought that this would be a um, useful thing to hook on um, for implementing the OpenACC kernels constructs. Of course, that also needs to do with the dependence analysis and transform then the sequential loops into a parallel loop. Unfortunately, uh, for reasons that I'm not explaining here this year, uh, that required some surgery where to put that past, Tom will remember. 
Uh, okay, and in the end, we found that this can handle some of the open ACC kernels cases, uh, but some is very limited. Um, and the reason for that is that it's not been written or implemented for the purpose that we try to use it for, because it was just meant to be used for one level loops and not for nested gang worker vector level loops, for example. Yeah, but anyway, it was a start. Um, so, and then the question is what to do when at compile time this par loops pass figures out that it cannot parallelize some code, it doesn't understand the code. You could have the idea of raising a compile time error. Um, the reason being that the user in a way wanted code to be parallelized but we can't. But on the other hand, you don't want to do that because compile time errors are for things where the, uh, where the user um, has written incorrect code and the incorrect code is, the, the code is not incorrect, just the compiler doesn't understand how to parallelize it, so that doesn't make too much sense. The alter other alternative, when you can't parallelize something, you run it as a single threaded GPU kernel, one gang, one worker, one vector. That's actually acceptable if there's not much computation going on in that kernel, so if it's just initialization of scalars, for example. However, uh, it's really bad for performance if this is a compute intense kernel or loop nest, because then, of course, if you will, we launch this as a single threaded GPU kernel, we're not using any parallelism that the um, hardware offers. And single threaded GPU code is really slow because these uh, GPUs are not written for that kind of workload. They are really uh, written in hardware description language, maybe. Yeah. Uh, they <laughs> are not meant to be used for such uh, code. Okay, then the other thing we can do is to just not offload this kernel computation and instead use the CPU. Um, the reason being that the CPU execution will be faster than the single threaded GPU execution and you also don't have to move the data from the CPU to the GPU and back. However, for that we have to disable all offloading in, in, in the program. Unfortunately, we can't just do this for one single kernel. So that's what I'm explaining here. It has to be a global decision for the whole program that is executing. And here is one example. We have a data region, so that specifies some data upon entry to be copied to the device or allocated on the device or just copied out at the end of, of that region. We have a parallel construct, parallel loop here that computes some value B or some array B um, with input array A. And this data region means that a visible copy will be created for, for these, all these elements here, A, B, C. So we call that a, de a device copy. So what this will do on the GPU, memory regions will be allocated and initialized in the case of this copy operation. Then the device copy of B will be, um, will, will be, um, assigned these, these results of this computation, function one here. Then we have following a kernel's construct which cannot be parallelized for whatever reason. Um, if we now decide to not offload this single kernel's construct um, to, to the device, we would then be working on the host versions of these variables here. So B host would be the original B that you have outside of this um, data region. And of course, that doesn't correspond to the device copy which has been um, assigned here. So you have a mismatch here between the data that you use and the same way in the next computation, which again can be offloaded and intends to use the C that has been computed on the device, but that has never been set because that was executing on the host. So that doesn't work, that's why the reason this, this avoid offloading stuff has to be a global thing, then all these computations would run on, on the host, on the CPU, instead of being offloaded 
that's of course not ideal because we want to offload stuff to GPU or other accelerator device. Of course, if we had much more compiler magic that could track these data dependencies, then maybe we could work around that and insert some update here to copy the device to the host, copy of B, and so on. But Okay, so that mechanism has not seen very much sympathy from other GCC developers, and that exists in our development branch only. On the other hand, also, it's expected to become obsolete at some point um, once we can, in fact, parallelize and handle all common open ACC kernels code. So that's why we're not spending a lot of effort on getting that into GCC trunk. Instead, we want to improve the kernels code in trunk so that this mechanism becomes obsolete. Okay, then back to the, or onwards to the OpenACC kernels rework. GCC has a reasonable implementation of the OpenACC parallel construct, the prescriptive construct, which this nested loop constructs that I've shown in this matrix multiplication example at gang worker vector level. Of course, there's still a lot of things to be improved, but you can get useful performance out of that. And then the idea instead of having the par loops pass do its own thing, the idea then is to instead um, map the OpenACC kernels loops onto that good OpenACC parallel loop implementation. So in motivation, one step back that I mentioned, par loops tries to handle arbitrary code, so it really looks into the sequence of instructions and tries to figure out where there are loops and whether it can parallelize something, what it, how, how it needs to transform the code. I've shown that example before. That's, of course, uh, something I invented. I didn't copy that from somewhere. Uh, but that's, so it's not surprising that this cannot be parallelized. Uh, I'm not blaming car loops for that. <laughs> um, but on the other hand, real world code doesn't look like that. Real world code looks like that. That's from some weather simulation, if I remember right. So you have a ACC, and that's Fortran, if somebody has not seen that. Uh, some ACC kernels construct directly nested in that a ACC loop independent. Then your do loop in Fortran, some conditional stuff. Then you have nested an ACC loop independent vector and another ACC loop independent vector. What that means, I don't know exactly, but that's separate discussion. And then all that's the do loop here and this do loop here and this do loop here is missing the end do, but then that ends and that ends the whole kernels region. So that's like the uh, perfect thing for us to parallelize. Um, you have this kernel thing and just nested loops inside of it that uh, you can guess independent means that the user tells the <coughs> implementation that all the loop iterations are independent. That means you don't even have to do any um, data dependence analysis, stuff like that. Another example, some C code, pragma ACC kernels loop, gang vector, and just this simple for loop, where even par loops should be figured out that there are no <coughs> data dependencies between these loop iterations because they all work on just the J index. So we've seen this, this independent clause. I briefly introduced that. Um, there are other clauses that can appear on the loop construct. Uh, sec, meaning sequential. It tells the compiler that a loop should not be parallelized or vectorized. The auto clause specifies that the compiler has to figure out whether a loop can be parallelized or can't. So that's essentially what's happening in a kernels construct by default. You can override that by specifying the independent clause, which tells the compiler that there are no data dependencies um, between the loop iterations, and it can parallelize that loop without any further transformations. So that's text copied from the OpenACC specification. With that, we can build up some correspondences between parallel and kernels constructs and nested loop constructs. So that's the most simple thing that I showed initially. You have in pragma ACC parallel, 
inside that you have a pragma ACC loop, which uh, with an um, implicit independent clause inside a parallel uh, construct. So if a loop construct appears inside a parallel construct, it has an implicit independent clause unless you override that with something else. So that's a very explicit form and that D3CC deals with that fine. The same you can do in a kernel's constructs. By default, um, you have an auto clause in, in, inside the um, kernel's construct, so the compiler has to figure out data dependencies. If you override that with an explicit independent clause, then you have basically the same thing as above here. And that was the work of phase one of this kernel's rework. So GCC can now also deal with, with such kernel's constructs. <coughs> and parallelize them in the very same way as it does for, for parallel constructs. On the other hand, inside a kernel's constructs, you can leave away all this pragma ACC loop things, as I have mentioned. The compiler then has to figure out that. Or you have your ACC loop pragmas and by default have this auto clause, which tells the compiler, okay, here is a loop that you should look to parallelize but I, as the user, still don't tell you if you can parallelize it. There may be data dependencies that you have to deal with. That's what Parloops then tries to figure out, but oftentimes fails. The same you can do in a parallel construct if you override this implicit independent clause that you normally have. Um, if you override that with an auto clause, you get the very same behavior of this one here. Um, and currently that's not parallelized. So in, in that case, we don't even try to invoke par loops to figure out data dependencies and stuff. Um, so that currently doesn't get any parallelization. So that's for phase two and later phases of, of such a rework. Okay, so back to this simple matrix multiplication example. That's what I've shown before, the kernels constructs and then just the original C code in there. What this kernels rework then essentially internally is doing is rewriting this just this kernels um, constructs again into a parallel construct because that's what we want to use in the following um, compiler passes because that's what's implemented already. And then it goes through the region of code, sees, okay, here's the for loop that should, in theory, benefit from parallelization. So it puts a pragma ACC loop auto in front of that auto because we still have to figure out if we can actually parallelize that loop and so on. Same for the uh, other loops. It also has to figure out in some way that there is a reduction operation going on here and probably has to add some kind of, not exactly this clause, but some kind of internal um, built-ins to do the reduction on, on, this, uh, on the corresponding layer of the parallelism level. Right, and so again the goal is to unify the internal handling of parallel and kernels, translate the latter into the former, make explicit any implicit independent or auto clauses depending on whether you're inside a parallel or kernels construct, mark up unannotated loops with open ACC loop. If auto clause, that's what I've just shown. Then we still need compiler magic to figure out whether auto means uh, independent or sequential. Or if we actually have to transform the code in any way to resolve data dependencies by doing some polyhedral transformations, whatever, or by synthesizing reduction clauses or privatizing values. But all that we need to do anyway if we um, eventually want to implement the auto clause for the loop constructs inside a parallel construct, which currently just maps to sequential execution. Okay, so then in more detail what's happening in, in, in this phase one work change the lowering in the compiler so that kernels are lowered in the same way as parallel constructs. 
and preserve loop nests in in the generic in, a, in the original form because in GCC um, the um, Gimple IR doesn't have a um, and separate constructs to describe loops. Instead, it lowers these into what I call your go-to style loops, so labels and comparison operations for the loop exit condition and go to here. And that's difficult to analyze, of course. And um, keeping it in, in the original for loop form is achieved by adding this loop directive to that. Then, as I mentioned, we have to make explicit and any implicit clauses. Loops with sequential clause are easy to deal with because they don't need to be parallelized and don't need to be analyzed. Independent also is easy because there the user tells the implementation that um, the loop iterations are independent and, as mentioned, auto clause is a bit more difficult, so that will persist in the through the compiler passes until we get to some point where we can figure out the loop um, iterations, whether they are data dependent or not, or form <coughs> code in some way. Then what's different um, in OpenACC, at the top level, uh, well, let's explain this the other way around. In the parallel construct, when you launch the code in a parallel construct at the top level, you have what I call gang redundant semantics. So all the number of gangs that you launch this parallel construct with in, uh, execute independently. Um, that compares to launching uh, multiple threads on a CPU where they also, um, in the case of, of uh, pthread, for example, you have one, one function that you launch and all the threads execute the same code, but they are not in lockstep. They make progress on their own. In contrast, in the kernel's constructs, you have the semantics, um, what I called gang single. So from the user's point of view, uh, you can't see that there are several threads executing. So that semantics has to be preserved. And then that's what was described in the uh, um, standard that I uh, quoted earlier and um, the open ACC kernels re region typically contains several loop nests and also sequential code. All these loop nests can benefit from diff different launch geometries, so the number of gangs, number of workers, number of vectors, or vector length. Uh, sequential code obviously has to be launched with one gang, one worker, one vector. But what we need to do is synchronizing after um, when you have, ah, I have an example coming up that's easier to explain here, right, okay. So on the left-hand side is the original ACC kernels code and on the right-hand side is what the compiler translates that into. We have here uh, some serial initialization code, then we have a nested loop which conveniently is all mapped up with loop independent. And then we can have some serial code and then we have another um, independent loop. But that one, for example, is just one level. And here we have three levels. Compiler would then split this up um, to launch this first serial code section as a single threaded GPU kernel then launch the next kernel for this nested loop constructs here. <coughs> um, and this is launched with a number of, of gangs, which would map to the, the, the outer ACC loop independent, would be mapped to the gang dimension. So number of gangs is bigger than one and all these gangs execute um, without synchronization. So if this next um, serial code um, instructions would appear right after this for loop, then um, it would be executed multiple times by different gangs. So that would change the semantics that we have here. That's what I mentioned that we have this 
uh, gang single semantics at the outer level that the user can assume. This serial code is executed, then all this loop nest here, and then there's some implicit synchronization here, and only after all gangs have arrived here, the execution of that serial code um, continues. And after, so that serial code again then is launched as a one-dimensional single-threaded kernel, and after that we have an, an another parallel loop construct, which would again be um, launched in, in yeah, gang worker vector parallelism. To figure out how to split up the origin, so that's that's the original kernel region here, containing serial code, parallel code, serial code, parallel code. To figure out how to split that up into these four um, GPU kernel launches, we um, came up with some decomposition algor algorithm, which really looks in at the code that it's seeing there, and then figures out whether that region that it's currently processing can be parallelized or not. Um, and does that recursively until it comes to some conclusion and at some point, um, for example here, serial code, okay, that's easy. Then we have this nested loop stuff here. Okay, that's also pretty easy because they're all independent. And then the algorithm finds that there is some serial code again that makes it stop this second parallel region and again switch to a new um, single-threaded region for, for this serial code. So that's what this algorithm is doing and takes care to preserve this gang single semantics. Um, what it's also doing that's why I introduced this avoid offloading stuff. If we only have simple, what we call their simple statements in a kernels region, um, executing that in a gang single way is preferred to avoid offloading for the whole process, for the whole program. Because if it's only simple statements, that means there is no looping in there. So it's just initialization of scalar variables and stuff like that. And such a thing can never be performance critical because that's just um, order of one effort, basically just the number of, of uh, things going on there. Okay, and yeah, some more details, of course. Um, what we can do to optimize this is to launch all, this, all these um, kernels asynchronously and then synchronize once at the end. So um, what, what I've shown so far um, is an ACC uh, parallel pragma. This launches a GPU kernel or whatever accelerator you're targeting. And at the end, so the, the kernel launch is asynchronous. Um, the execution on the offloading device is asynchronous. And the host code here has an implicit wait for the offloading computation to finish and then move on in the original host code. There is a concept to, to uh, launch or to queue um, such kernels asynchronously, which means you will preserve the order how they appear in the source code. Um, but that's still beneficial um, because for doing a kernel launch, you have to do a lot of setup communicating with your GPU or your offload device generally. And while the host, the CPU, is waiting for this um, first kernel to finish with this implicit wait down here, it can make better use of its time and already prepare the launch of the following kernels. So um, that just means that's again, I'm always using the same original kernels code here. Um, that means to put async um, clauses onto these um, parallel constructs <coughs> and at the end just synthesize a wait statement and then you will get the exactly same semantics as you had before, just it will be faster. Um, right, so 
what we also have to take care of um, making sure the original kernel's code describes the region that you want to offload to the GPU, want to have parallelized. It also does describe a data region. Um, and we have to maintain the semantics that you have in the original kernel's code. Um, so what we have to do here, for example, here I changed the serial code with some actual simple code. You have implicit copy clauses in, in the kernel's constructs if these are scalars. Um, okay, so these are made explicit early in, in the GCC computation pipeline. Um, we want to avoid copying the values with each individual argument, so what we instead do is synthesize a data region around all these parallel constructs and copy the data there and then for each of the parallel constructs we can tell the implementation that this data is present on the GPU already and if X then is set here that is setting it on the GPU copy of, of the original X variable and if X then is used here for example that will read it from the GPU from the device copy of X. So that's an important transformation and the other thing is that the kernels region is um, in C for example a block and inside that you can define variables and again you have to preserve the semantics that you have in the original code that they are um, live and keep their values across all the original code in the kernels construct um, so we can't split that or move, or make that um, one um, serial region here. We, we have to take care that this A and B in this example here are live across all the original kernels code. So we have to synthesize another nested data region. And yeah, so that's what you see here. This int A is split up the definition moved out here and then in here we have just the assignment so to get this defines the host copy of a the originally uh, original copy that doesn't make sense the original variable and then you we create a device copy a device b device which then again are both present to be present the device value uh, device variable is written to here and will live for, for all this data region here. So here we can read the device copy of A. Yeah, and then some special handling for um, specific clauses which can only appear on the kernel's construct. We can't just move them to the parallel constructs uh, or yeah, need some special handling or have different behavior whether the loop construct is inside the kernels or a parallel region. Right, and that we have implemented, that's working, and uh, we'll go into GCC trunk soon without the offloading, uh, avoid offloading pieces because that's not present in trunk. That makes things actually a bit simpler. So, status of this rework phase one um, if we have top level, to, uh, top level meaning in, in the kernels region, top level uh, loop constructs with independent clause, that gets parallelized now, that didn't happen before, so that's the big change here. If we have loop constructs with an explicit sequential clause, that cannot be performance critical because the user explicitly tells the implementation that something should not be parallelized, so that's fine to execute single threaded. If we have non-looping serial code, what I earlier called simple code, I think, that's also not performance critical. That's, for example, just this initialization set variable A to one and stuff like that. Even a GPU can deal with such 
things as long as it's not looping, it can't be performance critical. So that's also fine to execute single threaded. And for everything else, we still need par loops or still currently use par loops to decide whether something can be transformed into a parallel execution or not. And that's primarily then loops that don't have open ACC loop directives with independent or sequential clauses. So basically loop, ah, okay, that's here loops that are not even marked up with an open ACC loop directive or loops that have an, an auto clause. And that's what is phase one meant to achieve, unify the handling in, in the compiler to map, map um, kernels constructs onto the existing parallel support. Split up these regions, as I explained, translate the loop constructs, set up data regions and all that stuff. And that's it. Thanks for listening and any questions? Nathan. <laughs> That's uh, in discussion still. Um, so I guess you, of course, understand the ideas what's still missing and exactly when that's happening and how. Um, I can't talk about that, unfortunately. I understand what you're hinting towards, uh, alias information, stuff like that. Yeah, so that, that was a pr uh, implementation detail <laughs> problem with the par loops pass. And yes, it will already be split off, so we will have to figure out something for that. The, the splitting into regions happens right before the OMP lowering, if I remember right. So after gimplification, but before the lowering, because then we have to handle all these separate regions and can use the normal parallel processing. But what that means then is that we have, for each loop nest, we have a separate parallel region with loop auto. And the hope then, of course, is that the compile, the existing compiler vectorization passes and so on which all have the same problem, that they need such alias information and other information um, that we can build on top of that to do the analysis and transformations there. Yeah. No direct connections, that's just, I, I mentioned that in context of when, when there are data dependencies or to figure out data dependencies and graphite has uh, ways to transform the original loops, um, the code in the loops to avoid such data dependencies. So that's an idea to use that. And um, I also remember Tom and maybe Nathan also, we discussed this back then. Graphite has a lot of compile time overhead because it's doing complicated things. Um, but the kernels regions are typically small because they're just some computational element and not generic whatever code. And they are typically, as I've shown this real world code, they are typically well formed. So just loop nests inside each other. And so that I think it should be fine to enable such graphite or whatever else uh, unconditionally for um, such regions which are split into separate functions. So that's easy to do in the compiler. Um, you don't probably still don't want to enable graphite unconditionally for all your code that you're compiling because of the large compile time overhead. I am no expert on that, so May, yeah, I guess yes. <laughs> Can always import some ideas from elsewhere. 
any more questions? Still have some time left. Then that's it, I guess. Or? Um, you mean adding an actual loop representation? We, we don't do that. Well, in a way, it exists um, because the that's coming from OpenMP, which we built on with this OpenACC stuff that has a tree code um, on loop, I think. Um, but what that does is essentially just stopping the front end from doing this lowering. And then, of course, that has to happen at some later point. But we're not adding an actual loop rep representation on Gimple. I don't know the history behind that, why that doesn't exist, but I guess it's just that too many compiler passes would have to learn how to deal with that. And you need to support the go-to style anyway, because users can write code <laughs> that way. Okay, then thank you again.